it's um, it's too late to do anything else, and I've got too long till I retire. Uh, but really, it's it's a good milestone to look about you know what we've done and what's coming up next. Um, in my practice, I specialize in MRI fusion prostate biopsies. I do advanced prostate cancer, uh, BPH, and uh, a lot of female urology. I uh, went to college at Columbia, as mentioned. Haven't really left New York. In fact, I live in a house one and a half miles from the house I grew up in, so I haven't made it very far in life. Um, I did. I was uh, lucky enough to have my application selected by the New York section to participate in the AUA leadership program. A really a wonderful, fantastic program. I think almost all of the 22 um, colleagues that I did it with are still very involved in AUA leadership. Uh, some are chairmen and chairwomen, and some uh, have continued to be involved in the committee structure. Uh, I was, as mentioned, the, the Gallagher Scholar in 2016. I really got to experience everything the AUA does with a health policy emphasis. Uh, my timing was good when I finished that. Uh, I became chair of the Legislative Affairs Committee in 2017 and 2020 and was the inaugural chair of the AUA PAC. Currently, I'm the treasurer elect on the New York Section Board. This is really just to show you that you can have a full-time career uh, and do lots of interesting things on the side with the AUA. Um, that really is, is career affirming. Um, this presentation is a little bit different. There's nothing clinical about this presentation. Um, it's a discussion about career opportunities, career development. Um, I find it a great way to avoid the risk of burnout. I'm using my brain, my urology brain in a different way. I've acquired mentors over the years, and I've mentored others uh, in this process. And I, I believe I have a real impact on my colleagues' ability to pursue their goals of betterment of patient care uh, and interact with a really great group of nationally-based uh, urologists who are innovative and, and self-starting. So I wanna talk a little bit about why. Um, there's an author, Simon Sinek. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He's a TED Talk and a couple of books about understanding your why. And if you're able to communicate your why to other people and they resonate with it, you, you win a lot of people over. Um, physician advocacy has really exploded uh, in the last 10 years that I've been involved. Uh, and the AUA and organizations such as the ACS and the AMA uh, offer quality career uh, development opportunities. So those of us who haven't gotten their MBAs or, or MPHs, you can still um, develop your career within these organizations and while you're doing your regular job. Um, so Congress gets a bad rap. Uh, they're not perfect, but they're far from what you see on cable news. Uh, cable news covers these ideological battles. Um, it's not really how Congress always is. Uh, they want to pass things, um, but you don't really see the stuff that affects our businesses and our patients very much because they're not as sexy as some of the bigger issues that they do cover. So don't get turned off to Congress just based on what you see on the news. Uh, and once you meet a lot of these people, um, they're, they're all very accomplished people. They mean well. Uh, they come to DC with a real honest and, and uh, ambition. And sometimes what happens there can change them, but uh, they're all very smart people and very interesting to talk to. When we first started going down to DC, we were surprised to hear that they hadn't really heard from doctors very much. We just thought this was odd. They hear from hospitals, they hear from pharmaceutical companies, uh, insurance plans, but never really got the doctor's story about what was going on. And we came down with data and, and you know, actionable information for them and very you know, short explanations of why a bill was good or a bill was bad. And they really appreciated that because it, it helped them figure out the, the issues and, and work with us. Uh, telling stories about our patients is always a big winner with them. <clears throat> um, being involved in this process as a physician, well, it helps me figure out what's going on first. So when I come back to New York, I can explain to my colleagues what's happening. There's a lot of fear, a lot of worry about what's government's doing and how it'll affect our ability to see patients. A lot of discussion in the, in the surgery lounges about various solutions that doctors have come up with. But all that's really noise because unless you go down there and talk about it, it's not really uh, actionable. Um, I think that protecting urology has been very gratifying. And when I say protecting the specialty, I'm not being um, hyperbolic. 
you know, we've been in situations where we could have lost a lot of what we do had it not for our physicians and patient groups with us fighting for certain bills. Um, and the people you meet, like I said, I've met some really great people who I never would have met who practice across the country. Uh, you know, the urology group of people, I think in general are, are very, you know, we tinker, we're smart, uh, we're motivated. Well, even the subgroup of people who get involved in AUA leadership, they're even more so. And that's been a really fun way to spend my career. Um, I just wanna acknowledge some of the people along the way. Uh, Dr. Kapoor uh, is the one who encouraged me to go to my first urology advocacy meeting in 2010. Uh, we literally went the weekend that the ACA was being passed and we were on the Delta shuttle out of LaGuardia sitting next to Congressman um, um, Nadler um, right there uh, as they were going to vote for the ACA. Um, and it was quite an eye-opening experience going down to DC. Dr. Carl Olson uh, has become a personal friend. He's been tremendously supportive of what I do, I've done outside the clinical practice. Uh, Dr. Eugene Ree, uh, who's out in California, and Dr. Mark Edney, who's in Maryland, were sort of my contemporary mentors when I first got involved. Uh, they had been doing a few years before me and, and were great examples. Dr. Willie Underwood is a prostate cancer researcher up in Buffalo. Dave Penson and Chris Gonzalez have been the most recent chairs of the Public Policy Council. Uh, and I've been able to acquire some ment mentees. Uh, Kevin Ku, who's been uh, very involved in young urologists and residency committees. And Dr. Denise Asafu Ajay, who may, some, may, may you some know from Columbia. She's dynamic, she's smart. We're all lucky to have her in our specialty. And she's been fun also to, to give advice to. A quick civics lesson. I know this slide's a little busy, but essentially, um, you know, we start with an idea. We start up here with an idea, and then it goes to the Senate or the House, really both, and the, they will introduce it as a bill. Um, so if there's a piece of legislation that we'd like to be passed or someone else wants to be passed, it's introduced as a bill, and then it goes to a committee. So the committees of jurisdiction for healthcare typically are, you know, on the House side, there's Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, um, the Senate Finance Committee. So there are usually a couple committees that specifically deal with healthcare issues. And this is important because the leadership in those committees, including the, the minority and the majority leadership, um, important for them to be on our side and to get some co-sponsors for this bill. Because if the leadership's not interested in our bill, it's not gonna go anywhere. Once they get through committee, um, they go to the, the general floor for uh, a vote. And if they pass, uh, what happens is they go to a conference committee, which will resolve any slight differences between the House version and the Senate version. And once that's done, there's a bill and both houses then sign it. And then it goes to the president. And typically, if he signs it, it goes into law. If he vetoes it, uh, it really has a bad ch hard chance of getting into law. Um, so this is essentially the legislative branch of the government. As interesting and probably even more important is the regulatory part. So that was laws and legislation. This is regulations and rules. So Congress has passed a law and the agency that's involved with this law for us often is CMS, which is Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, will develop rules. So a one page law may end up with 100 and 200 pages of rules. How is this law gonna be implemented? Um, that is open to public comment periods as well. Um, and eventually that rule goes into the federal register and after a comment period becomes a final rule. So many of the things that we have to fight as doctors are rules out of laws. So we have to also deal with agencies uh, and CMS. Now the rule making agencies are under the executive branch. So the flavor of the executive branch rules will mimic the party or the person who's in the, who's in the presidency. Um, it starts with the law and the rules are kind of how it's, how it's done. So when we're dealing with something like MACRA, which is the quality metrics law, we actually deal with CMS because they're implementing the law and the rules and, and the things we have to do to achieve high scores for, for, um, for MIPS. 
um, or if we're trying to get advanced payment models within urology. So um, a disease process like prostate cancer, we want to treat um, under a, um, a risk um, program. We would go to CMS's agencies, uh, CMMI, for example, and talk about what we want to do with them. Now, when presidents make executive orders, essentially they're making a rule and bypassing the legislative process. So one very important example happened last year. Uh, President Trump um, made a rule about drug prices. And the thought is that they wanna lower drug prices to be more in line with drug prices in other countries. Now, this is not actually a partisan thing. Uh, both parties are trying to do this. But President Trump had, had promised to do this and did this uh, just before the election. Um, and the public comment period really was uh, not adhered to. Uh, so two lawsuits occurred. Uh, the problem with this rule would have, it would have uh, restricted access for lupulide or Provenge or any chemo for patients who don't get them at a major large institution. So someone who lives in a rural area or someone who doesn't have access to a major university setting would all of a sudden not be able to get lupulide because of the way they were pricing it. Um, so two lawsuits came out. One noted the public comment period was not adhered to, and one was uh, about access for care. One was in California, one was in Maryland. So the rule was challenged in court. Essentially, it died um, after a restraining order was placed on it. So that's one example of rulemaking um, and how that goes. And a lot of the work that we do will not always be with legislators. They'll be with the CMS agencies. Um, sometimes we will advocate to Congress to direct CMS to do certain things or not do other things. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but that's essentially a different process. So this is rulemaking, which is executive branch as opposed to the legislative branch. So everyone now knows about telemedicine. Who knew about telemedicine 18 months ago? You probably didn't, um, but in the UA, we've been talking about this for five or six years. Doctors Eugene Rie and Aaron Spitz were both in California had written a white paper about it. We've been advocating for telemedicine coverage on the Hill for years with no traction. Now the Medicare rule is there is ability to do telemedicine. There's a code for telemedicine, but you have to be living in a certain rural area. The, the patient has to go to a certain facility to then access on a video, a doctor who is licensed in that state. What made telemedicine available is that specific part of the law has been waived. It's waived temporarily. We've had it re renewed a couple of times. But when people say, oh, telemedicine's here to stay, it's, out of, it's, it's the, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Well, that's not true because Congress can get rid of telemedicine with a single vote or not renewing the waiver. It could go away literally tomorrow. It's not likely to, um, and we've seen the power of telemedicine and how it's getting us to patients and patients to us who really need to see us, who can't travel or are afraid to travel. And furthermore, because telemedicine was only really being paid full for video visits, a lot of us have gone down and talked about how people without broadband access, older people who don't have the ability to use a smartphone were being shut out of telemedicine. So the CMS has been more open to letting just phone call visits qualify as telemedicine. And we have a bill on the Hill that will make this waiver permanent. So that's one of the things that we're doing in the Hill now, of course, if they don't renew the waiver. Now the waiver is in place, I think, till the end of the calendar year at this point, but if they don't renew the waiver, this could all go away. And these are some of the kind of things that we deal with in advocacy that hopefully you guys never have to witness in your practice. Uh, another interesting and scary thing happened a few years ago. So a lot of the academic surgeons like to say, well, this doesn't really affect me. I work for a university. Well, many of us are on, are on RVU basis now uh, to evaluate our workload, uh, what we get paid if there are bonuses. So CMS came out and they reviewed robotic prostatectomies a few years ago because the numbers had gone up significantly. 
And when a, a code is utilized more than it has been to a certain degree for a certain amount of time, it automatically triggers an audit. Some of you may have gotten emails talking about, hey, do you do the surgery? How hard is it? How long does it take? How much supplies do you use? And most people unfortunately don't reply to the audits. But these audits are important because then ultimately the RUC committee, which is the AMA and CMS use these surveys to determine how a code should be valued. Um, so we didn't do great with the responses for Robert Bag prostatectomy. CMS used a different sort of laparoscopic code to compare it to Robert Bag prostatectomy, which didn't make sense. And then essentially dropped the RVU 33%. And that was kind of illegal because there's a limit to how much you can do that. But they dropped the RVU 33%, but they increased the practice, practice expense on the code. Well, if you work for a hospital system, you're not getting paid through the practice expense. You're getting paid based on your RVUs. So a 33% drop, drop in the RVUs means that if you did 150 case, 100 cases last year, you have to do 150 cases next year to get the same RVU credit. Obviously completely unfair. And we flooded CMS, absolutely flooded them with uh, responses and papers to explain how they were just wrong. And they never, ever, ever, ever turned back. And this was really one of the first times they ever did. Now they didn't bring it up to all the way where it was before. The final cuts were much, much smaller than the proposed ones. And this was an unprecedented finding. And this is again, the power and the need for urologists to be involved in advocacy. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the United States Preventive Service Task Force. This has been gone over and over again, so I won't spend too much time on it, but essentially it's a good case study. Uh, they came out with a prostate cancer screening of a D in 2012, I guess, um, which meant that not only was the screening not helpful, it was harmful to patients because they decided if you got a PSA, you automatically got a prostatectomy and automatically had complications. Um, their methodology was completely flawed uh, in so many ways. And again, not to belabor the point here, but we've heard about this before. But people like David Penson, who's at Vanderbilt, um, who's an expert and brought in other experts. And again, emphasized to the test for us how, how wrong they were. They really weren't that interested and they came out with the D grade. Um, as a result, PSAs weren't being drawn. And remember, PSA screening is different than prostate cancer screening, as we know, but they didn't see it that way. Um, and there was a stage migration to more aggressive disease on presentation for prostate cancer patients. They, um, now at the time, in the early 2010s, we were starting to do more, more active surveillance anyway. Um, and then we got legislation introduced with bipartisan co-sponsors to increase the transparency and report requirements of the task force. So this was a, you know, not to get to too much again, but they had these powers that no other committee in, in executive branch or anywhere else had. They didn't have to have a public comment period. There was no transparency in how they got to their results or how they picked the members on the task force. And this is unique for them. Um, Marsha Blackburn, who at the time was a uh, representative from Tennessee and Bobby Rush, who's a representative from Chicago, were front and center on helping us get traction with this bill. And this is another important point. So Marsha Blackburn has since become Senator from Tennessee and she was one of the senators who were not gonna certify the election. After the riots, she was the one Senator who then changed her mind to certify the election based on what happened, but she's still fairly conservative. And she gives liberals a heartburn, essentially. Bobby Rush is about as left as you can get. Now, to do this kind of stuff, you have to put your other politics to the side. Our job is healthcare. Our job is protecting urology. Our job is protecting our patients. So you're going to sit in a room with someone whose politics are very different than yours and politics who make, make you mad. But you have to put that aside. You have to focus on healthcare. You can have your own personal politics and your own personal time. When we're dealing with our, our representatives, 
who can help us and help urology and help our patients, that has to be put aside. Um, so, you know, the, the, the two urologists in Congress um, both voted to decertify the election. Depending on how you feel about that, you might find that a problem with them, but they will go to the wall for urology. So I think it's important if you're gonna go into something like advocacy for healthcare, to be able to push your other politics to the side. Uh, you have to understand we go after representatives who, who believe in our cause, representatives who are in committees of jurisdiction who can get our bills through. And I think that's really a very important point. Um, essentially, the, the legislation was introduced. Um, they went one step further. So CMS very surreptitiously decided to make PSA screening by a primary care provider a negative quality measure, which means that if they ordered a PSA on their patient, they would lose points on MIPS. And they put out a stealth email saying, hey, you've got three weeks to comment. Let us know what you think. And we saw the email and 4,000 responses went to CMS and they dropped it very quickly. But we were that close to completely losing PSA screening from primary care and completely losing prostate cancer uh, as urologists. Things then bounced back. They didn't uh, necessarily in, the, in their findings differentiate African-Americans who have a higher rate of prostate cancer than other groups. So funding for prostate cancer research in the, in the community was introduced. Um, eventually, after all this fighting and pushing the, and, and, ground, and on the ground um, discussions with primary care, the grade was changed to a C, which basically means shared decision-making. It's not perfect, but it then takes us out of the, out of the concern of being completely eliminated from, from care. Veterans care is very important to us. Um, we, um, we've done a lot on the Hill to protect our veterans. Um, Dr. Edney, who I mentioned before, who's from Maryland, he was a Gallagher scholar as well. Um, he fought um, in, uh, in Iraq uh, as a reservist. Um, he pushed through Eurotrauma. Eurotrauma was a, a research fund uh, for the Department of Defense to focus on your urology trauma in the combat theater. There are funds that already exist for brain injuries and eye injuries, and he worked tremendously hard. And eventually that Eurotrauma bill was passed. Uh, fertility benefits for veterans. So if, a, if a, a, a military person is injured in theater and sustains pelvic injuries, but remains active duty, well, through the DOD hospitals, they can access fertility care. But if they're so injured that they're discharged from the army, the VA has no such fertility benefits. So they completely lose out on the ability to have children. Now, the ASRM, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and Resolve, which is a patient group, have been front and center helping support this kind of legislation. Unfortunately, when it comes to fertility care, IVF, embryos, um, the Republicans tend to have a problem backing this because of religious concerns of conservatives. Um, so we have strong D support, but not so much on the right side. Um, but we continue to push because it's important to protect our veterans and no one else, no one else, no other doctor is gonna fight for a man's reproductive rights after he's been injured. We're the only ones who will do it. And that's why we have to. Uh, we were also front and center when uh, there were uh, the controversy about veterans waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks for cystoscopies and bladder cancer care. And some were dying because of that. And we worked with the VA to have a system where they could take their VA card and essentially come to a, a civilian urologist and the civilian urologist would be reimbursed for the care. And this helped uh, men from the VA who could not get care because of long waiting times get care from a civilian urologist. GME funding is another fight we've been having for years and years and years. Um, in 1997, um, the levels of um, funding for Medicare Medicaid was frozen. So that's about 200 spots a year for urology. We have a lot more than 200 spots now. So the hospitals would fund these spots on their own. 
then of course, Medicare rates have been, um, inpatient rates have been cut dramatically, which is making it harder and harder for hospitals to fund these residents on their own. Um, shortages are looming. Urology is the second oldest specialty behind um, uh, chest surgeons. Um, and as the population gets older, certainly they need more urologists. So how do we train more urologists without money to help train them? Uh, so we've been fighting to get uh, um, new residency slots. Medical schools a few years responded by increasing their enrollment. Of course, that's easy when you're in medical school because you're charging tuition for the most part. Um, so now they went up three to 4% on their graduating doctors because the residency slots have not been increased. There are, doctor, there, there are people graduating medical school in the US who can't find residency slots. Um, now there was a bill that was passed during the reconciliation that allowed for a thousand more GME slots for people in rural areas. Uh, the problem with most of these bills and most of the things proposed is they all go to primary care. So we've been pushing to make sure that half the slots go to specialists as well. We're working on a proposed bill, not exactly the same, but proposed bill to give specialty surgeons loan forgiveness if they work in underserved areas. But this continues to be a fight uh, in order to keep our ranks strong and keep our residency programs thriving. Regulatory relief, I think this is a, uh, we all can share in this. Uh, many of you know what prior authorization means. Um, it's very hard to get a medicine or a surgery or a treatment approved by an insurance company for a patient who needs it. Um, and they use all kinds of tricks to make it very difficult. Uh, essentially, some of them just make you do it over the phone and our staff spends hours and hours on hold uh, for things that sometimes don't even get approved. Um, step therapy is another example where a medication that's not really the medication you want to use, not quite as safe, not quite as good. Well, the insurance companies will have to make you use that medication first before they'll approve the safer, more effective medication that you want to give your patient. Um, these are the things that we go to the Hill to fight. Um, and we have some bills there um, that are looking to help um, make insurance companies be more transparent what, with what they will and will not cover to make their um, prior authorization processes electronic so you can type it into a computer and not have to wait on a phone for hours and hours. Um, MACRA, which is the quality metric program, um, some of them were a little hard to follow. And for some doctors in rural areas or underserved areas, they're impossible to follow. Um, so we go down and we talk about regulatory relief on MACRA. Now, again, all this stuff is technically regulations. It's CMS. So we will go to CMS and talk about it, but we also do go to the Senate and the House to have them encourage CMS to do better and help us. Uh, and advanced payment models for urologists was a, has been a big topic. You know, part of MACRA, there's MIPS, there's APMs. Uh, APMs are just bringing a disease process together, doing a shared risk model where you can take care of prostate cancer, maybe cheaper than you could before. Well, this is good for ACOs, even some oncology practices, but we've had a hard time getting our plans approved. And they've admitted to us saying, you know, you've clicked all the boxes, but we really, really never meant to let urologists hold the bag on this. So by going back to Congress, we we're pushing to have them open up these APM models uh, to surgeon specialists. Um, so we can do better for our patients as well. Research funding was always a no-no because you don't want to go to an office and ask for money. If you ask for money, you have to explain where the money's coming from, at least on, in the Republican offices. Um, and that's kind of hard to do. Um, so we never really did it. That was probably a mistake. Um, Dr. Toby Chai is the outgoing chair of the Research uh, Council. He's been liaison to the Legislative Affairs Committee. And he's done a tremendous job. So one tremendous win we've had recently was we were, we were advocating to the NIH. 
And they admitted that, hey, we have a lot of money for Alzheimer's disease. That's not even being used. If you can tie incontinence to Alzheimer's disease, well, then come apply for our money and we'll help research urology research out. And our minds blew because this was an amazing moment. So again, advocating to these, to these regulatory committees um, and the executive branch um, works. And it's opened up a whole new area of funding for urology research that we don't have to then explain where the money is going to come from. So urology's prison on the Hill is actually a lot more than just the AUA. We have the AUA Government Relations and Advocacy Office in DC. They're actually just a few blocks away from the Hill. Uh, so they're constantly in offices. They're meeting with representatives and their staffs uh, on a monthly basis. Um, the AACU has a staff that does the same thing. And the large urology practice, LUGPA uh, community is doing that as well. So having three distinct urology groups, it broadens the impact on, on, on the Hill for our issues. Not all of our issues are exactly alike, but having urology always there and, and hitting the, the office as much as possible um, helps make these things happen. If you go down once a year, well, they're easy to forget you. But if different groups are coming several times a year, um, it makes a bigger difference. Um, we make relations with both sides of the aisle. We have to. We don't really go after a bill unless we can get co-sponsors from both sides and both houses. Um, we meet with executive branch staff, with CMS frequently as well. Uh, there's a, something called the Doctors' Caucus. So there are doctors, physicians, and other health professionals who are Congress people. Um, like I said, Neil Dunn and Greg Murphy are both u retired urologists who are in Congress, in, in the House. Um, Phil Rowe, who just retired this last session, who was an OBGYN from Tennessee, has been tremendously helpful. Um, he's had prostate cancer. He shares that. Um, and with all of our prostate cancer and healthcare legislation, he's front and center. Um, having doctors on the Hill does make some of these discussions more easy because they know what we go through. And again, he's a Republican from Tennessee. He may not be everybody's cup of tea with all your politics, but he's an amazing guy and, and was, would fight for urology without even asking. Um, again, we do try to target people in leadership and on committees of jurisdiction. So Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, Senate Finance um, will help, certainly help get our bills uh, through. Um, now we also go to our local representatives um, to help push that through as well. The more, more co-sponsors, the better. But uh, these are the people we will, we will target. Fundraising is important. Um, now it's a little confusing, so I'll try to really simplify it down. There's this thing called Europac. Europac is a political action committee um, that at one point was co-administered by the AUA and the AACU. This made for some legal issues because the, the Federal Elections Committee doesn't like when there are two different groups with one PAC. Um, so the AACU now solely administers Europac. AUA PAC is administered by the AUA. Now, again, for both these things, when you have a PAC, there's a limit to how much you can give to each congressperson per election cycle. But it does allow us to pool a lot of funds from a lot of people and then give to these representatives in a meaningful way. Uh, I will say that as the outgoing chair of Europac, of AUA PAC, excuse me, um, young urologists can join. Uh, we've, we've we prorating the donations based on how many years you've been in practice or been training. So if you're a resident, you can give as little as $25. And we encourage that. And you can become a member of AUA PAC. Uh, and we'd like to you know, build a, 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 um, an environment of giving, a culture of giving. So as you become more able to give more down the road, um, there is that process. Um, you have to give post-tax, after-tax funds. You can't give corporate funds uh, to be given to uh, representatives. Um, so we ask that you don't give your corporate credit card, but you have to write a, a personal check or your own credit card. Uh, LUGPA does it slightly differently, but also very effectively. 
uh, they do more direct giving to individual members. So they'll have an event for a, a representative or meet the representative and have some of the members write a check directly to that member of Congress. Uh, it does allow for more giving overall. Um, so there are different ways of, of going ahead. Now, why is there a PAC and why is there Euro PAC? And basically you have to be a member of the organization to give to the PAC. Um, so if you're a member of AUA, but not AACU, you can give to the AOA PAC. You have to be a member of ACU to give to your PAC. And many of us are members of both. Uh, but we did see that, you know, the AUA has a larger membership and a lot of them were not a AACU members. They didn't really have an outlet to give money uh, to the PAC. Uh, these are not PACs that are fighting with each other. Uh, we technically legally cannot interact with each other on that level. But um, a lot of the issues that we're talking about are the same. And anytime you can get three different groups of people talking about urology issues on the Hill at different times of the year, it does make it seem like it's a larger group of people. So I would encourage whichever of these organizations you are affiliated with, um, please give. Um, and like I said, for the younger doctors, we want to create this culture of giving. Please give even a $25 donation. Uh, finally, um, one of my hopes was, as chair of the Legislative Affairs Committee, was to diversify the ranks. Uh, when I went down there, it was a very, a lot of late career people involved. Um, we want to have different academic practice environments, academic doctors, independent practice doctors, doctors who are employed or in multi-specialty groups. Um, so, Right now, it's much more diversified than it used to be. We want more experienced members. We want younger members. Um, gender, again, is, is a priority. Um, and what I found was uh, I spoke to Lindsey Kerr, from, who was president of SUA at the time, and talking to various people in various programs. And we didn't really have a good sense of what some of the barriers were for some people to get involved, um, not to tell too many confidential stories, but some women doctors, some of them uh, have young children and it was an extra burden for them to go to a meeting um, than we had thought. Um, so to make meetings more kid friendly or spouse friendly, or to allow some of these obligations during fellowships to be done remotely online. So these are some of the changes that have been made to make it more welcoming and friendly. Uh, some young doctors, men and women, they were afraid to rock the boat. They didn't want to say to their chairman or the resident director, hey, I want to go do this thing and spend, you know, two weeks in DC outside of my residency program. And because of that, they never brought it up. So we've reached out to residency directors and, and, and chairs of departments to say, look, this stuff is around. If you think you've got someone in your group who might fit in and you can spare that person, uh, please do. And you'd be surprised how many suggestions that we got. Uh, ethnicity is very important. We've always had a, a group of different faces in the AUA, but not from all ethnicities. Um, some people don't apply to urology because they're not sure there's a place for them there. So recruiting at the medical school level as much as everywhere else is important. Um, I feel a diverse delegation makes a more effective meeting on, on, in Congress. And I've been to the Hill in several of those situations um, and there's just more of a, a resonance with the staffers and the representatives. And we have a nice, um, diverse group of people in the room, whether it be age, gender, or, um, or ethnicity. Uh, in December of 2020, the AUA has started a diversity inclusion task force. I believe Brian McNeil, who's in Brooklyn, is part of that task force. I would encourage you all to get involved. Um, you can go on the AUA website, and just you know, type in this diversity inclusion task force. The press release will come up, and the opportunities to get involved uh, are there. Fun opportunities are many. Uh, usually, the AUA advocacy summits in March. Uh, this year, it's going to be in 20, in July, uh, and be virtual. Double ACU has their own meeting to fly in. Uh, urology also participates in the Alliance of Specialty Medicine. So I'll go down with orthopedics and ophthalmologists and other specialties 
in July, and it's fun to hear their points of view and what they struggle with. Often it's the same thing, some in, in a different way. Sometimes they have different issues that we're happy to support with them. And obviously the AMA and the American College of Surgeons are partner organizations where many of our members have been involved. Uh, Dr. Willie Underwood, who I mentioned before, is on the executive board of the American Medical Association. Uh, he's very influential there, and that really does help urology. Uh, and many of the fellowship opportunities, leadership opportunities that we do in the AUA are actually partnered with the American College of Surgeons. So there are plenty of opportunities to go in this year. Um, there's no excuse not to go. It's free, it's virtual. There's also state advocacy issues. Things happen on states much quicker than federally and can happen without you knowing about it. And there are many stories about how some of these things happen. Uh, I will say on a positive note, and Dr. Kapoor certainly was involved with this, um, as the US PSCF has been threatening PSA screening coverage, well, we got New York State to pass a law requiring PSA screening protection. And this was done on the state level. Um, a very big issue right now, and Dr. Lane Palmer, who we know has really been front and center with this one, are these multi-state efforts to ban genital surgery in children. And it's sort of a very sort of strange way this came about. Um, there are these anti-circumcision groups uh, who then approached the AMSA, the medical students, part of the AMA, and they passed a resolution and they were giving a lot of false information and then claiming that we were, you know, assigning genders that weren't the, the kid's choice. The irony is that the urologists who are in, in reconstructive medicine uh, take care of the LBGT community, certainly the trans community quite, quite a bit, um, yet at the same time we're demonized by the, by the community. So a lot of work has been done to educate the legislatures and the public about what really is going on, um, how there are multidisciplinary meetings with parents and doctors about these all the intersex cases, um, but hypospadias has been banned or, or threatened to be banned, circumcisions, et cetera. And certainly CAH patients who are at risk and in pain can't get the surgery if these things pass. So this has been um, a scary, um, time for, for pediatric urologists. And uh, Lane Palmer has been really again front and center uh, by fighting this off with a lot of help. This is a bad slide, but basically it shows the committee structure at the AUA, and it shows that there's so many ways to get involved. The data committee, science and quality council, public policy, coding and reimbursement, um, regulatory, there's so many ways to get involved. Um, and I would encourage to seek out something you enjoy. Again, I will push the AUA Summit. Um, this is my first year not on the planning committee in a long time. It's fantastic. Again, it's free. It is virtual. Um, very little excuse not to do it. And you'll learn so much. Uh, the lectures are amazing. The keynote speakers are amazing. And you actually get to go to the Hill virtually and meet with representatives from, and, and Senate, senators from your state and from your jurisdiction. Really fantastic thing. It's on the AUA website. Again, it's free, it's virtual, and you'll learn so much. It's like getting a mini fellowship in advocacy. July 20th, 21st, go on the website uh, and please register. You'll, you won't be sorry. So if cable news isn't, isn't good, well, where do I get my news? So there's something called Health on the Hill podcast. Uh, Matt Duckworth, who works for Heart Health Strategies, uh, we've worked with this, um, this lobbying group for a long time uh, with the AUA and, and other groups. Uh, it's 15 minutes once a week. He just talks about these health-related bills that you won't hear about anywhere else. Uh, the Hill uh, and Politico are also excellent. They have apps as well, and you can type in healthcare. And you'll get the stories about the things that we're talking about. Even The Economist, even though they're a British publication, sometimes will cover some of the wonky stuff that we're talking about uh, in their pages. So you want to steer clear of the big names, the Times, the Post, um, CNN, Fox News, because they're not going to ever cover anything that's not you know, drastic and certainly nothing that we end up caring about. So again, I would, I would look for Health on the Hill. It's on the Apple podcast. I don't I just enjoy hearing it. Um, 
and The Hill and Politico are excellent. Again, there are apps for those. Um, you don't have to become a member. You just type in the healthcare section and you know, read it once a week and you can see what's going on. So in summary, uh, thanks for listening. I know it's a lot of stuff. Um, I really appreciate everyone listening. Um, it's open to anyone who's interested. Uh, I've enjoyed great career satisfaction. Uh, I feel like I'm helping our specialty and our patients. And talking to federal and state lawmakers are, are actually, it's actually kind of fun. Uh, they, they look to us for, they, they see us as professionals and experts, and they want to hear what we think. And the AUA itself offers several opportunities to get involved. So again, thanks for listening. Uh, and now I'm open to any questions.